Hi everyone, thanks so much for listening to another episode of Dogman Encounters Radio. I'm Vic Cundiff and I'll be your host for the show. Before we bring on tonight's guest, if you've had a Dogman Encounter and would like to speak with me about it, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. I'd love to hear from you. If you've had a Sasquatch sighting and would like to be a guest on Bigfoot Eyewitness Radio, please go to bigfooteyewitness.com and submit a report. All right, let's bring on tonight's guest. Tonight's guest is Jay. Jay, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Oh, thanks for coming on. You know, we appreciate your time. Jay, please give us a brief bio on yourself. Uh, Well, my name is Jay, and I'll be 31 in August, and I live in Cleveland, North Carolina, and I raise and train dogs, um, and I do rescue work, and I do wildlife rehab. So if anybody hears anything in the background, it's because I've got a couple litters of puppies that are in my room, and they're very playful. Oh, no doubt. I'm sure they keep you busy. What kind of puppies are they? Uh, I have uh, Chawini puppies and a litter of beagle puppies. <laughs> I'll bet all of them are awfully cute. Cute as a button, I'm sure. They definitely are. They're, they're pretty cute. <laughs> oh, I'll bet. Jay, from what I understand, your mother, who has Native American blood, says you talked about cryptid-related things when you were small. Please expand on that for us. Uh, yes. Um, when I was younger, I'd say I started at about four or five. Um, I would describe Bigfoot to my mother and various other kinds of cryptids. And actually, they like to tease me for it. I had what they called my imaginary friend was a Bigfoot. And she lived in the woods behind our house. And I would go out there and play with her. And I'd tell various stories about it. Um, and I mean, it was a long story about her and she had her family, and they were all different sizes and colors. And at that point, I'm pretty sure I never really knew what Bigfoot was. But that's when my brother, you know, gave the, what I was describing a name. Because, I mean, I was, again, five years old, and I had never seen anything related to Bigfoot. But I had detailed stories, and she uh, she liked to listen to them. And she was a very spiritual woman, so she was very deep in the Native American beliefs and culture. And she took everything that I had described to her at pretty much not just like face value, but she in depth listened and evaluated. And she was always the person I went to whenever uh, later on in life I had sightings and she listened to me and she taught me about the different cryptids and creatures and uh, different things that we had in the, uh, Native American culture. So it was it was something I talked about from when I believe five years on onward until I was probably seven or eight, maybe a little younger. And then we moved from the house we had been living in. And it just I never talked about it again at that point there. Wow, you got an early start. I definitely dove headfirst into the paranormal, different kind of world. I dove headfirst into that kind of stuff and None of my siblings were kind of involved in anything like that, but I've always been intrigued and enlightened and just constantly wanting to learn more. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. You had your first dogman encounter when you were 15. Actually, it wasn't far from where you live now. What kind of an effect did that have on you and your ability to do the kinds of things that kids do at that age? Well, the first encounter... um, it was definitely an eye-opener situation because most people, you know, they talk about it and how they want to see it. And me, I was always the one who wanted to see something, the one who was excited and ready to. And after the first encounter, it changed a lot about how I did things um, because I was always ready to go off on my own, walk off into the woods, go for hours on end, come back. And I was not really as afraid of going out at night like I used to be. I mean, I was not really a skittish child when it came to exploring. Um, And after the first encounter, it started spiraling to after various encounters to where I no longer even like to go to the woods at all. Um, In fact, where our property is now, the closest I get without my father or a friend or anything, even during the daytime, is just to a little bit in, in the wood line just a little bit into it, um, and I won't go any farther. But yeah, the first encounter, 
was just about three or four, four or five maybe, miles down the road from where I live now. It's a very small rural area. I mean, there's it's a vast land, but it's kind of very few neighbors. Yeah, it sounds like it. Unfortunately, considering that you have dogmen all around now, at least it seems like you do. Unfortunately, you're behind enemy lines, but yeah, we'll talk about that later as we go on. For the listeners who are wondering why you'd choose to live just miles from the location of your first encounter, what would you tell them? Well, after we moved out of the country settings and I lived in the city for a few years, I started raising my two nieces when their mother passed away and my mother passed away. And uh, my father, he was living not too far from where we live now, but it was just a rental and he wasn't really dead set on it. And I wanted to get my nieces out of the city and I wanted to move back to the country. And um, my aunt's home is beside of us and her and my uncle were living right there and the house came up for sale beside of them and had a good bit of land. And since I have the dogs, I needed more space and I always wanted to get back to the country. Because I was born and raised in the country, and I've lived in the city, but I prefer the land and the quiet and being able to see the stars. So when it came up for sale, my dad said, hey, do you want to go in, pull our assets together, get this house, finish raising the kids, and that way both of us have a set place in the future? And I jumped on it. And at the time, I mean, I thought about my previous encounters. And I thought about the situation, but I had lived in the city for so long that I had kind of, I would say I'd lost the majority of the fear about it. I still didn't go outside at night and things, but I didn't have as much of a problem with it. And my uncle passed away shortly after we moved in. So we were there to help kind of be a support for my aunt. And it was kind of important for me to get as close to family as we could that we could see. I don't blame you for wanting to live in the country. I mean, there's nothing like it. So yeah, no one can fault you for that. Considering how many encounters you've had with dog men, do you feel cursed in a way? I mean, early on, I would say that it did feel kind of cursed. And at times it'll be like a situation where you're like, well, why do I have these experiences? And why is it so many? And so forth as, why is it not happening to as many people besides me that live with me? Or in the beginning, it would be like, well, it's cursed everywhere I go. There's something that pops up. But the thing about North Carolina is we have, we have a lot of historic value and things. And we're rated one of the most paranormal related states. We have Uari National Forest, which isn't too far from me. And it's one of the big Bigfoot capitals. They, they, they love that there. And we have a lot of national forests and it's really kind of a part of it is a city land and then part of where it's really nice country property. So it's kind of, I figure it happens to a lot of other people besides myself. So in cursed in a way, but I can tell my stories and reach out. And if anybody's had an encounter and they don't feel comfortable talking about it, if you talk about yours, sometimes they feel a little bit more ease. So I wouldn't call it cursed. I'd call it, more kind of like encounter inclined. You can put yourself out there to accept things and sometimes you will notice more than you would say if you don't believe in things. And you'd write it off as, oh, that's just this, that, or the other. Whereas if you're more inclined to open yourself, you're like, okay, let's look at the the detailed description of what it could be, scientific value, or when those options are gone, evaluate it and see where you're at. Wow. I like the positive spin you put on that. Yeah. You could always dwell on the negative if you wanted to, but yeah, the fact that you're so optimistic and the way you look at those experiences, that's good to hear. And that's refreshing. All right, Jay, you've got a bunch of encounters to tell us about. So please do that. Now give us every last detail that comes to mind. My first encounter happened in February of 2004. It was the year I was turning 15, and my sister had moved back from Maine, the Canadian Maine border right there. She had moved back with her two girls, so we had decided to get a little bit of land and two houses on it so that myself, my mother, my father, 
could have one home and then on the same property, my sister could have hers. And we had moved in a couple months before that, but it didn't, the first encounter happened in February. It was the way to kind of, I would guess, would describe the land first would be easiest. It was probably about two or three acres right around there. And on the top part of a hill would be my sister's single lodge she was living in. And then it's a hill slope, a couple hundred yards. And then it would be our home with a half wraparound porch. And then we'd have the land behind of us cleared about an acre or two. And then we'd get the wood line. And behind my home, I had about 200 feet of dog kennels. And then another, I'd say 20 by 20 maybe 20 by 30 dog run for my livestock because I had chickens and ducks and I had goats at one point. But the first encounter was the night before Valentine's Day. And my mom would put together little baskets and things for the kids and myself on every holiday. So it was probably, I'd say, around 8 o'clock. I'm, I'm going to guess and say around 8 o'clock, but it was definitely evening. And she was putting the little baskets together in the kitchen. And most of our lights were off. And my dad was in our couch watching some TV. And we lived next to a bar. because so we had no neighbors on either side of us except for the bar. And then in front of us across the street, we had one or two smaller houses. But the bar on nights, they'd have people drive up in their motorcycles. And they'd have a good time. Behind the bar was a mechanic shop and sometimes as anybody who has dogs will know that whenever there's loud sounds or people hollering the dogs tend to bark and get excited so in evening time I would get together some treats I'd carry a little bucket with dog biscuits and we'd take peanut butter jars that were half empty and we'd give them to the dogs to keep them busy at night and um, so I had my little bucket with me and I told them I was going out back and I went and um, stepped out the back door and something that keys into this is the man who worked in the mechanic shop. He had a dog. I'd known the dog since I think the day he got him. He was a really sweet dog, just a little mixed breed. He was probably size of a Labrador, maybe a little bigger. And he was really sweet. I mean, honestly, as far as neighborhood dogs come into your yard, you couldn't have wanted a better one to show up. That plays into it. So as I go out the back door, not not thinking about much, because I had been all over the woods there. I had went out every day since I really didn't have anything else to do and explored, and I'd take them with me. As I go out the back door, normally my dogs would greet me in the kennel run. They'd bark or they'd get excited, and instead they were quiet. And even the chickens and ducks, which were in the roost, but they were quiet. And it, w it was abnormal because they were really loving sweet dogs and they were staring in the middle of the backyard. And we had one of those telephone poles that had a light on it that would switch on automatically when there was movement. And so I turned my gaze and there was the dog. His name was Mo. So there was Mo in the backyard. And instead of maybe running up or waiting to get a tree or greeting me like he normally would be. He was just standing there and his hackles were raised and he was letting out little snarly growl sounds, which was abnormal for this dog. He was the sweetest tempered dog. And so I was confused for a moment. The whole encounter probably only lasted a few minutes, but it felt to me and still does like it lasted for a lot longer. So I followed his gaze and I'm thinking, well, maybe there's some raccoons or foxes or something along those lines. And when I looked, the light was casting around this shape. And while I could not see its face exactly, because it was the light was hitting it from behind, I could see a lot of detail for what I could. It was crouched down and had one hand on the ground and one kind of resting raised up over its leg. And it was crouched kind of like somebody who would be bending down and looking at something on the ground, but its focus was on Mo, and it wasn't scared of him. It wasn't, it wasn't afraid. It was just staring at him, kind of contemplating. 
like, you know, it, it was not bothered. And I could, I could make out the color. It was mostly black. It had medium thick fur. I did not see a tail. Um, the hands that I could see from where I was were very kind of the best way I can describe them from my point was kind of looked like a raccoon because I do wildlife rehab and I specialize in raccoons and they looked similar to a, a raccoon. The one that was just, I can only see the one resting over its leg. And I suppose I had been really quiet at that point because I hadn't made any kind of sounds. But at that point, as I stared at the dog and the creature and I took it in at first, I had assumed, you know, before I noticed the detail, oh, somebody from the bars in the backyard or something like that. But when I spoke, I'm not sure what I said. I can't remember the exact words, but I do believe before I made the kind of gasping, shocked sound is I said the dog's name. The dog only looked at me for a few seconds before looking right back at the creature. And as I said, this thing was not afraid of this dog. He did not care. My dogs were quiet. They were just staring and waiting. And as I made the sound, it turned a little bit. It did not get off the ground. It just shifted its body and its head to look right at me. And it tilted the head a little bit as it looked. And the feeling that I got when I saw it was I had always wanted to see a sighting of some kind of creature. I had longed for it. I thought it would be awesome. I would not be afraid. I was wrong. Immense terror kind of shot over me and I was still for a few seconds I could not move and the only thing that got me to move was it kind of acted like it was going to stand up it was crouching to get up and it put both hands down to kind of push up off the ground a little bit at that point Mo switched from what he was doing and he lunged and was snarling and growling and trying to bite at it and I dropped my bucket of treats I turned around, I ripped the door open, I ran, I slammed it, and I locked, there was about two or three locks, I locked them. And in a panic, I cannot remember what I was bubbling out of my mouth, but it was a bunch of nonsense, complete terror. And I ran to the front door and made sure it was shut and locked, because we had a screen door, so we'd leave the front door open. And I mean, we had never felt any kind of need to lock up or anything at night because we lived in the country and nothing much happened out there but at that point I was going to make sure it was closed I was going to make sure it was done and um, as I closed the front door my back hit it and I slid down and my mom glanced up she was a little concerned my dad asked what was going on I told him I said I don't know what I just saw but there was something in the backyard and you could hear kind of growling and barking because the dogs had stopped being quiet at that point. And I was terrified. At first, I thought I had seen Bigfoot. And I was telling my mom because I didn't know what a dog man was. And for several years, I had no clue it was a thing. I didn't know they were around. So I'm babbling on and I'm terrified. And my mom goes to look out the back door. And I was begging her not to open the door. Because if there's one thing in this world that meant more to me than a lot of things, it was my mom. And I didn't want her to open the door. I did not, under any circumstances, want that to happen. And so she went and checked out the back door. And both of them were gone from the backyard. Dogman was not there. Mo was not. But there was scuffling and sounds in the woods. And you could tell they were chasing each other off or so forth. I'm not quite sure. But so I was petrified. My father assumed, you know, I had just seen a something he didn't know what he couldn't explain it he tried to say maybe i'd seen a bear or somebody had been messing around next door and was just wearing a costume but the utter terror i had from that encounter had put a light in my mind i'm not alone when i'm out there and i i started changing how i did things i did not go outside alone at night by myself at that point in our yard and i did not trust the dark as much because I had been a child like I just I grew up I loved sitting outside at night I didn't fear anything and I mean my mother had told me many Native American stories and I knew what to do and not to do in situations but the encounter 
changed all of that. It was not like anything I had been raised to think about. And we started changing, my mother did, how I interacted with the woods. Because I would go out there and I'd take, I had one of those old digital cameras and you'd have to scan them into the computer. And I had gotten one. So I'd go out there in the woods and I didn't have a cell phone because, I mean, I didn't have one until I was about 16. But I'd carry a shut off cell phone. If I had to dial 911, it would call. And my mom would just let me wander. So I had taken some pictures and we had scanned them. And we saw in the shadows something bending around the tree. And you could see just like the shape of dark black fur on one side of the tree. As if the hand was there and it was leaning around the tree watching. And I'm not even the one who picked it up in my photo. I was looking through them for the woods. And my mother noticed it goes zoom in. And I did. And unfortunately, like it was very blurry. You couldn't make out exact details. But you could see the black fur. And my mother said, you're not going back in by yourself. If you go, take your dog. Don't go far. Take the phone. And then she would prefer I wait and go with my father. Because he, he's a hunter. He's hunted his whole life. He's got so many stories about that that I hear new ones all the time. But my second encounter living at that location was I was on my computer in the kitchen and I was, I can't remember what I was doing on there, probably early 2000s YouTube where you could only load a three minute video, but you had dial up. So it took you a long time. And my mother was fiddling around in the kitchen and she was looking up our kitchen window and it was just a little above the sink window watching and it was nighttime again and she normally didn't just stay there she was always doing something and she said come here and I walked over towards her and I was like well, what she goes no come look at this and I went to turn the light on and she goes no leave it come here so I huddled over there and I looked out the window and she points she goes look there's little ones and I didn't know what she was talking about but the way our dog kennels in our backyard were is we had dog toys in the yard and we had some rabbit cages for transport and some dog kennels and we had them all stacked up towards the edge line of the woods away from the dog fences so they couldn't get to them and right behind the dog crates and kennels area you could see movement in the trees and every so often it would be like something was pushing something out of it it'd fall get back up and run back and forth and you could see every so often an arm or something would pop out and it was very similar to what I had seen. And my mom goes, I think those are babies. And they're playing. And we watched, and, and sure enough, they were playing and just running back and forth in the edge line. They would not go too far into the light because it was on because it sensed the movement. And it would pick up stuff and move things, like, you know, kind of jiggling it around. At one point, one of them had bumped into one of the wire rabbit cages and it had fallen over. And the movement stopped for a minute and you could see like the outline of the shape and the shadows kind of watching it fall. And they had been, I guess, playing with one of the dog toys. It was a rope toy like you get at Walmart or something like that for the dog. And it looked like they had been playing with it back and forth. And it got thrown into the light in the middle of the yard and they kind of stopped for a minute. And then they went back to playing and my dad walked in and he flipped on the kitchen light. And when the light came on, they ran off and you could see the leaves shaking because they had sensed the light in the house. But as long as the light was on, they weren't too worried. And at that same location, shortly, I'd say after we started having the encounters where we'd see them playing at the edge of the woods, I had my chickens and several of them started getting killed. And it, it wasn't a kill to eat. Some of them would get eaten, but most of them would just be killed and I'm not sure if it was the adult dog man or the babies, but they were, I think, learning to hunt or whatnot. And they just, I'd wake up and there'd be several dead. We had, for that Christmas, my mother and father had gotten me a pregnant goat because we had goats when I was growing up. And I was so excited. And she had her babies. And one morning we went out there and the baby, he was gone. He was just not in the, in the fence. He was missing. There was no blood, no fur, nothing along those lines. He had just up and vanished. And it was, it was really disheartening. And it was a really rough loss because I had bottle raised this baby goat because his mom didn't really have the mother instinct. And 
So I had to learn to milk the goat to get the bottles and raise him up. And he lived inside for a while until he went out there. And we went searching for him. And we didn't find him. And it was a worry at first that maybe somebody had taken him from the yard. But then I just chalked it up to maybe what killed the chickens took the goat. And my father, <laughs> he likes to tease me about my sightings and things. And he goes, well, no, you just had a chupacabra. That's what it was. You know that's what you want to say it was. And and I, I teased him. And I was like, well, we probably have one. I've seen something. And me and mom saw him. And it was a few months after the baby went missing that the mother goat was actually killed. And she was inside the fence, just had been killed, but there was no, it's hard to explain it, but it looked like she had had her neck snapped in a way. And she was just gone. And she had been a healthy goat, nothing wrong with her at all. But she had been killed similarly in the way of the chickens. They just did. And after that, I was offered to get another goat. And I said, no. I don't want another one. I've had these ones. I don't want to lose more. And the, the things out there had never bothered any other animals. Like our dogs never had any problems. And we had, we had a couple cats go missing out there, but they were just strays we had taken to feeding. And my sister also saw sightings the same time that I did, but she would try and give it explanations, but she couldn't. She would see things running through the, our backyard, or as my mom called it, she said they were still the babies playing in the edge of her woods, and she heard things coming on her porch. And the one thing that stopped me from wanting to go outside at all at night after my original sighting was I was on our porch, and we had woods on either side of our house between us and the bar, and there was kind of heavy footfalls making its way through there. And a low grumbling kind of growling sound. And I said, no, I'm done. I'm going to just get it done in the daytime. It doesn't matter what it is. I don't want to be around it. We have had several off and on encounters while we lived there. And as I said, I'm not one who gets afraid of many paranormal things right off the bat. Because I've had my own experiences with those kinds of things. And my mother, like I said, she taught me the difference in creatures and what's good, and what's not. But she really didn't have a lot of words of wisdom for this. And we didn't know what they were. My mother, she believed in werewolves like I did. And she's like, well, maybe it's just one of those. And we just don't want to mess with it. And during the time living there, we had only lived there for a few years. My sister became sick with cancer and we had to look for somewhere to move. And we uh, packed up and we moved about, I'd say it's about a 40 minute drive from here and we moved to Davidson, but our home was in the middle of Davidson Concord and it was, it was just in the middle and we moved out there again to another place in the country and the property there, our home was up on a hill, a very steep hill and I had my room and there was a big tree behind my big giant bedroom window and we had a lot of good land we had two neighbors behind us about half an acre away and that was it until you walked down the road and then there were a small little group of houses and everybody kind of stuck to themselves and I was actually away from home when we moved in there because I was touring with a uh, church group and it, it happened rather fast my sister passed away I left and went on the tour and my parents were moving things in for me to when we, when I wasn't even there. And it was quiet in the beginning there, I'd say. Not too long after we moved in. Um, I do not sleep very well at night because I'm always awake. I have insomnia, so I don't sleep much. So everybody else sleeps a normal schedule. The sightings there started a few months after we moved in. The very first one, I would say, would be, Dogs were kind of barking and carrying on in the backyard. And I looked out my window and I couldn't see much because we had another one of those motion activated lights. And so I decided to go take a peek and see what was out there. And at the time I thought, oh, wow, that's a really big German Shepherd dog. Because it was walking around in front of the fence and sniffing at the dogs. But it wasn't shaped right. And it saw me. And I don't know the fear of an animal. I'm going to go up and I don't care if it's the meanest, nastiest looking tempered snarling dog. <laughs> I have that mentality. 
it's the dog. I'm going to touch it. I'll pet it. If it's me and give it time, it'll come around. And that's a good mentality and a bad one to have. In this situation, at least I didn't get hurt. As I stepped towards it, it kind of leaned forward a little bit. And I can describe its head perfectly. It would be if you took a raccoon, a German shepherd, a wolf, and you kind of put them together. The ears were really tall and narrow like a German shepherd's, but well-furred, kind of like a wolf. And it had a bald, broad head like the German shepherd. And I work with exotic animals, and I have wolf dogs, and I've had a coyote that I rescued. And so years later, such as now, I can differentiate appearances, and I can speak animal behavior a little bit better than I did when I was 17. <laughs> this happened when I was 17. So it was about 2008. Or no, no, 2006 it would be when it happened. I got my numbers crossed. But it stared and tilted its head, and it was not friendly. I wouldn't call the first one I saw friendly either, but it wasn't friendly. It was, I'd say, if I had to guess a weight on it, I'd say at least as big as a mastiff. Probably about 200 pounds or more, but it was big. So I assumed big German Shepherd, and I had not lived there long. So I didn't know any of the neighborhood dogs. And I moved forward, and its color, from what I could see from the light, was a grayish brown with kind of more brown accents throughout. And I didn't get to get a good look at its feet or anything to tell if it was different than the dogs, but it was shaped funny and it was just weird. And as soon as I could move forward to it to try and get a good look, it snarled, did a growl sound. I had never heard anything really similar to that kind of sound. And it made a movement. And then as if it thought otherwise, it, turned tail and headed towards the woods. And I mean, I'm pretty sure had I kept reaching, I would have been bitten. Um, Cause I had reached out like I was gonna pet it. And like I said, I don't know fear when it comes to an animal. I'm willing to do what it takes if it's needing something. And I went back inside. It was a really weird experience. It was, it was kind of like a deja vu kind of thing, but it wasn't, it was more detailed cause I had been closer and I hadn't been afraid because it just looked like a normal dog. But when it ran, it ran kind of, it was on all fours, but it ran kind of with its back hips at an odd angle, such as like it wanted to run, but wasn't used to running that way completely, or it was awkward for it. So I went back inside and I asked my mother the next day, I was like, does anybody have a German Shepherd? Because I think I saw one and I described it. And my dad goes, well, maybe since it growled and stuff, you just ran into a mean dog or a really big coyote. And I was like, well, no, I'm not sure. But it didn't like me, and which is weird because most animals generally gravitate towards me. And I've never met that I'd say one or two dogs or various other creatures that did not like me that I couldn't tame up. My father calls me the animal whisperer. And all of his friends call me if they have a problem or they need help with something that has to do with an animal. And that was the first encounter at that location, which led into so many more. It was like I left, it was like moving from the frying pan to the skillet to the boiler. It just was an escalation. So that was the first sighting we had there. And it wasn't too long after that, that they started doing construction work in the woods in front of us. And the big encounters started after that moment. My father had this sighting, which leads into the other ones. He was cutting grass on the lawnmower during the daylight because I had never had an experience in the daytime yet. And once you have your first daytime experience, you don't trust night or day. You just worry. So he had his first one. He was cutting the grass in our front yard at the end of the hill. And he was on the lawnmower and he stopped it, I believe. And he was doing some work on it. And he glanced over where they had gutted the trees out and it was a slow process we liked to go over there and look around and see what they had found because it was an abandoned house in the woods too an old tiny one such as somebody had just left it and never went back but he's sitting there and he's fiddling on the lawnmower and he looks up and he looks and he says it was big or bigger than a bear and it walked like a bear because i didn't see a tail its head wasn't right and he can describe the color he said it was a sandy brown, darkish color, 
pretty much about the fur length you think of a dog or a bear. Broad, really big head, wide shoulders, wide everything, but also slender at the same time, kind of muscular. And it was walking with its front feet splayed out, kind of like, kind of like a bear, but more finger-like. Like it was, like the hands were just completely out in front of it. Like you would, if a, like when a baby's crawling on its hands and knees with its palms flat. And he was staring at it because he's a hunter, so he's been everywhere. And he's hunted in all kinds of weather and different states and climates and everything. And he's been in the swamps near, uh, near alligators. And he's been, he, he's been everywhere that a hunter can go. And he said, never seen anything before like it in his life. And he's watching it as it's walking. And as if it knows he's looking at it, it turns and just tilts its head to look at him a little bit. And then it walks off. And there was no tail. It didn't have a tail. He likes to always remind everyone it had no tail. <laughs> My father does not believe in dogmen, and he doesn't believe in Bigfoot or many cryptids. And he, he, he gives me a hard time because I do, but he'll always stress that it had no tail. And it, and it resembled kind of a bear, kind of a big dog, and he didn't know what it was. And still to this day, it is his most paranormal cryptid sighting and he can't put a justification on it he says well maybe it was a bear but it didn't really look like a bear and so he had that sighting and he was telling us about it and I believe I was either I was at home at the time I was either inside because I didn't go anywhere when I was that age and he started talking about it he's like it was really weird so the same day we're discussing it I was like well when you get done with the grass let's go on over there and, and see if we can see anything and he finished up his yard work, and I took my little flip phone camera I had, and I took my dog with me at the time. This dog never left my side. He was rescued from a shelter in Gaston County. Most people from North Carolina know that shelter. It was not the best at the time. And I rescued him, and he was about seven months old. He had never left my side. He went with me everywhere. He did not even go outside for a few minutes at a time without having to come back in if I wasn't with him. So me, my dad, and the dog's name was Adonis. He was a beautiful Great Dane Boxer mix. He was a sweetheart, just a big baby. So we chugged along over there to the wooded area where they had ripped up. And when they do construction work, there's always a big resource area where the water runs off or the drainage or the sewage. And North Carolina, we have clay red mud. It, it creates a disgusting very thick consistency and you can't get it almost anywhere else it's just kind of like clay or like play-doh is the way where you touch it it's going to leave it there for several days it's it's going to harden and dry out but it's going to leave that cast there so we head over there and we're walking and we're trying to he's pinpointing whereabout he thought it was and we find the first paw print in a series of many and he's a big guy. He's got very large hands. And he, he always stresses when I'm telling the story. Tell him about how big it was. It was huge. So he's, I mean, he wears a size, I think, 13 ring on one of his fingers. He's got very large hands. That he worked his whole life doing different kinds of weld work with them. So they're scruffed up, but they're big. And he sits his hand beside of it. And the beginning of the toe imprints are near the tops of his fingers and the paw pad of it is right a little bit below his and it was splayed out at an odd angle and then the claw indents were really deep and we were staring at it and looking and I took a picture of it and for the love of me I wish I still had my flip phone but I could probably dig up the picture somewhere if I tried so he I took a picture of it and I said hey let's follow it and see what it does and at that point, Adonis was running around with me, and he was sniffing the tracks, and he, he didn't really act one way or the other. Like, he seemed disinterested. And we start walking and tracking them down, and soon it stops from being all fours. And the back paw prints on this thing were long and kind of odd-shaped. At the time, I hadn't had experience with a lot of exotics, so I couldn't pinpoint what they looked like. But it looked more foot like like a, like more of human shape but not quite human and then at some point it stopped being all four feet it was just the two and it 
headed into walking into the brown, nasty clay mud resource pond. It was about halfway into the resource pond. It was a big, big, like a very vast size of nothing but muck. It jumped. It looked like it had just jumped out and landed on the other side of the bank, like something had just pushed off because the, the track stopped. And at the time I was staring at it, I was like, it went from four paws to two and walked like a person. And again, I had never heard of dog man. I didn't know it was a, a thing. We were just staring at it and I had taken a picture or two and I was trying to tell him, I was like, that's not normal. And he's like, well, maybe somebody who was doing construction work and just walked over the paw prints and we can't see it anymore. So we went on home and I was telling the story to my mom and Tell her about them, and I showed her the picture. And at the time, she goes, well, that sounds similar to, like, a skinwalker. Like, it can pretend to be an animal, and then it shifts, and it's different. And I was like, oh, okay. I knew about them. I had been taught and read. And I was like, well, I mean, my dad didn't believe in that. So he was like, no, it was an animal. I saw it. So I took my little picture, and I went on my computer and tried to find something about roughly the same size of the paw print. And the closest I could get size-wise was about a tiger, similar to a tiger size or a bear, but it was a little bigger. And it was probably, I mean, we went back over there to look at the tracks because my mother wanted to see them and she wanted to see when they disappeared. And we took me, her, Adonis went with us again and my two nieces, they were fairly young at the time. And I felt uneasy while I was walking around. I felt kind of watched and I didn't, I didn't like it. It just felt like unwelcome, kind of a weird feeling of just someone staring at you, but in a way that's not pleasant. And we headed back home and my mom goes, did you feel that? And I said, yeah, I didn't like it. And my mom always trusted me to come to her and tell her if I had an experience with any kind of activity. And I was like, I just don't know what it was, but I didn't feel right. She goes, yeah, I didn't either. I don't want the girls going over there again. If you do go, wait and go with your dad. Because we were living separated at the time. My father had moved to Mooresville, and he was living down there. We were still living in Davidson. And it was probably just a few days after that, I let Adonis go out to the bathroom, and he didn't come back. He was only outside for a few minutes, because like I said, this dog would not leave my side. He would not wander off, and we didn't have normal traffic through the where we lived, like, you know, random people had stopped and picked him up. We didn't have that, but I went to go get him. He was gone outside maybe five, 10 minutes. And I went to let him in and he wasn't there. And he just vanished. We put up missing dog flyers online. We called the shelter, but they, if the shelter had been there to pick him up, they would have knocked on the door. And the people in the neighborhood, I'll call it a neighborhood, but it was just a few houses stretched out. They would have, you know, checked with me because when they found missing animals, they came to me and asked me if they were mine because they called me that little girl who lives up on the hill with all the dogs. And they'd bring them to check on me and let me know. But he vanished. And it seemed to escalate from there after he disappeared. At night, it was a different level of escalation. It, it started shortly after that. The first thing was we would have the dogs go crazy off and on and sometimes they wouldn't be loud at all but we had woken up one morning and I went out the front door and there was a deer skull and it was cleaned not like a hunter would clean it but it was cleaned and there were some marks on it and it was just left on my front porch and it was kind of odd and nobody would have done that I mean we live in North Carolina Hunters don't leave their items. And we didn't have anybody who would. I mean, there was not, we kept all to ourselves. Everybody kind of kept on their own. You were polite. You said hello and discussed the weather or something. But that was pretty much it. And my mother came out and I was like, this was just here. And the first thing she says, is she says, don't take it inside. Don't keep it. Just, we don't want it. And I was like, okay. And had it stopped at that, I mean, I wouldn't have thought of it any other way, but it didn't. There would be kills kind of left at our home, but they wouldn't be like in the yard. It would be left like on the porch or 
behind my bedroom window or behind the girl's window. They didn't sleep in their room. They slept in my mother's room, but that room was directly in front of mine. The very next big thing beside a small kill or so that was left was a deer hide. And it was kind of jagged how it had been skinned, but it was casually laying on a branch of the tree in our front yard, just laying there as if it had just been left. And I'm pretty sure my mother, had it just been the skull at one point, she would not have said what she said next. But she said, don't touch it. Don't take it. She goes, if something like that brings you a gift, you do not take it. Because you are going to open yourself up to a whole different level of something you're not prepared for. And this is my mom. And like I said, she was heavily involved in spirituality and different things. And she, she was a very religious woman. She was a Christian, but she allowed me to learn the difference in the native American type things and folklore. And we'd have conversations where we'd meet heads and we'd go over stuff. And when she said, don't take it, I knew, and I didn't take it. She called my father and she said, come get rid of it. I don't want it here. Well, my father, he took the deer skull back to his house. And I didn't learn that until later on. But luckily for him, it did not seem to have any kind of care to do with him. It didn't seem concerned. But he came over and she made him get rid of the skin. And she said, don't want it on the property. Throw it somewhere. And she made him get rid of it. It didn't stop at that. It was kind of a gesture at that point where it was bringing more and more things. And I'd say this went on for several, several months. My friend at the time had been staying with us off and on, and she'd come over for several days. She started to feel the uneasiness about it, too. And she'd, she'd be, I don't feel like we can go in your yard sometimes. And I'd be like, I know what you mean. It feels as if something, even if you can't see it during the daytime or nighttime, is looking at you. And you don't feel as if, oh, there's somebody watching me. You feel as if you're being looked at as if something's toying with you, kind of stalking you a little bit. And it made you feel uneasy, just like you couldn't get comfortable in your own skin. She had uh, been with me one night, and we had heard growling and all kinds of weird sounds. And... She was going, are you sure you don't have like a coyote out there or like a bear? And I was like, no, I don't think so. I mean, we could have. We lived in the middle of nowhere. And there was one that was just down a couple miles away that had been sighted. And she's involved later on in a different part of the story. She said, you know, you can't keep pretending it's not happening. But your mom's right. You can't feed into it. And I was like, okay. Yeah, I mean, I get it. Don't go outside by yourself. Don't. Take things that are offered to you. And we were coming home one night. It was me and my mom and the girls were in the car. And our driveway was really steep. I mean, it was a rough hill to get up. There, up. And we had another one of those poles in the backyard, like I said, with the light. And as we were coming up the driveway, we looked over at the fence because I'd always look right at the dog lot to kind of check on them. It was my automatic instinct. And... It was underneath the light. And this one was the sandyish brown kind of color my dad had mentioned. But it wasn't as big as, say, my later on encounters. It was not as big. It was, if I could say, it was probably about three, three and a half feet at the shoulder on all fours. And it was kind of crouched down a little bit, but sitting kind of like a dog, but not correct. And as we pulled in the driveway, it kind of noticed we were there. The dogs were barking. And it took off and ran into the woods. Now, I will say that most people, when they have encounters, they're like, oh, it did this, that, the other thing. Some of the ones I've encountered have just ran off or so forth. I believe personally that those are the younger ones who aren't as bold, to say, this, say the least. I think they're not as bold. The big encounter at that location that made me change my entire opinion on them being non-confrontational and just trying to make peace was the one night we were dyeing our hair in the kitchen and 
me and my friend, and we were having a good time, and we would be, we were the only two awake. My mother was asleep, and the girls were, and as I said, my dad lived away from us, and she was like, hey, let's go sit on the trampoline, because we had gotten a trampoline, and I was like, okay, sounds good. We'll go sit out there while the hair dye soaks in, and she'd call her boyfriend, and we'd be on the phone, and just normal teenage things, so we were walking out the door, and automatically when we walked out the door, it was a different atmosphere. It was like neither one of us was willing to tell the other one it felt wrong, but we were not going to be afraid enough not to do what we wanted to. And we got to the trampoline, and the sound started before movement. And as I told you before, Vic, when we talked, now that I've had experience with exotics and working with wildlife and wolf dogs, the sound I can recognize now is resource guarding versus what I thought was just growling. Because there's a difference in I don't like you to don't touch that, it's mine. And it was a snarling, kind of snorted, kind of growl. And it was it, it was pure dislike, pure anger, pure don't come any closer. And on the outsides of a double wide or a single wide, you have kind of plastic siding that goes along the bottom. It's got a proper name, but I can't remember what it is at times. And it started moving, like the bottom of it. And the growls were louder. And it's like you could tell whatever was under there was angry. And it wasn't pleasant. And we we tucked tail and we ran. Now that I look back on it, if I could talk to my 17, 18-year-old self, I would be like, don't run. Don't turn your back. Don't run leave but but definitely don't give your back to something that can get you and we went as fast as we could and we heard it kind of rip free and you could hear the sound of big large paws hitting the ground i mean it put immense fear in us we we had encountered different various paranormal things together but nothing like that so we 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 ran in we locked the door we, we went over what was going on. And at that point, like I said, we didn't know what a dog man was. And we didn't know this, that, or the other from it. So we decided, and my mom, we talked about it. Mom goes, well, maybe it's a demon. Maybe that's what it is. And it's taken this form. and Because we had had some other paranormal things going on at the time, not related to it. And she's like, well, I don't know what to do. I pray about it, but I'm not sure. And at that point, my friend was like, do we have a paranormal team like in our area? And at that point, we had one. I mean, I think they were starting out similarly new to the experiences. And we contacted them online. And we had spoken with them through emails and a few phone calls. And we had described what was going on prior to the experience running away when it was busting through the siding. At that point, we contacted them. We told them what happened. We were like, it manifested it was gonna get us i mean it was out for malice the woman and, and most paranormal teams like they'll go in various situations and they'll help people this team could not they um she goes i have to discuss this let me get back to you like they had been planning to come out and do an investigation they were going to stay overnight we had made arrangements the woman calls me back she goes they are backing out one by one they don't want to come. She goes, and it's nothing to do with you. She goes, they don't feel safe. And I was like, okay. She goes, I can email you some prayers to say. I can email you some information. She goes, but we have a medium in our group, and she comes with us. She's told us not to go. She says, whatever it is, we'll get angrier if we come out there, and we won't be completely safe. She goes, I just I can't do it to my team. And at that point, I mean, being an 18, 19 year old girl and at my wits end with what was going on and just complete and utter terror to now just be in my backyard. It was, it was disheartening. Like this was my one thing, the one thing that we had been holding out for to try and have some explanation, maybe do whatever they could do to get rid of it. Because at the time, like I said, we thought it was not a solid creature because we didn't know. And they had backed out. They just left us for our own. We were, we were just a shot in the dark. I was 18, 19 years old, had been dealing with it at this point of the property for about a year or two. My friend was a little younger than me by a few years. She didn't know what we were going to do. We were just, we were, we were stuck. 
And the sightings there kind of intensified to the point where you could hear the growling most times under the windows outside of my room, my mom's room. It would bump against the, the side of the double wide. It would, it would move things. That's another thing that happened was our stuff would always be moved or missing. And it still brought the gifts. Like it still brought things. It, it left its kills in the yard. We, we'd have different kinds. I mean, half eaten things, freshly killed things that were not eaten. And I mean, being that young and not really knowing how to describe and, and reach out to people because you're afraid somebody's going to think you're crazy. And me and her, we were just like, what are we going to do? We don't, we don't know what to do. It was just, it was really rough. And I fell into a really bad depression because it wasn't getting better. And I, I had lost a lot of my faith in different things. And I just, I wanted nothing more than to just leave and not live there. Because at that point, we had found physical tracks besides the ones we had seen. They seemed about every other day there was an occurrence. The only godsend I had was nothing really happened to my dogs. And I had gotten rid of a bunch of them, found them new homes because I did rescue work. So they were always in and out. And I just, I couldn't do it. We had two outside cats at that location, both of which were strays that we took in. They left and they vanished. I'm not sure if it ate them or if it left because I don't think the cats stay when it starts coming around. Not necessarily that it gets them, but I think they leave because they don't want to be around it. So it carried on. It never stopped there. The interactions never really stopped. We actually found a different place to move to. And it was just about, I'd say, two or three miles away, maybe, maybe two or three miles. If you had actually just walked through the woods, straight across through where they were doing construction work, there'd be a road once you got out of the woods. And then you go the next road, and that would be where we moved to. We didn't move too far away. But what I can say, Vic, and I can still acknowledge, is that nobody has lived at that property since we moved out. Um, people have tried, but they don't stay there. They just, they won't do it. They leave. And before we moved in, the house, well, the double lot had been on the market for a while for people to move in. Um, the last tenants had left, too. They, they, they didn't tell us why. And my mom didn't think to ask, really. The only thing my mom cared about was making sure we didn't get in a place that was way too haunted for me to handle and for her to handle. So we, we moved, and it was so refreshing. We moved from the dogman encounters to a more haunted situation house, but given this day and time, I would gladly take the ghosts and spirits and things any day over the dogman encounters. It was so calming. It, was, it wasn't perfect. But it was better. I relaxed. I was in my own skin again. Nothing happened. If only it could have lasted like longer than it did. Um, the same friend was with me, and we were hanging out with one of her friends, who was one of my friends at the time. And we had not lived in that home, I'd say, for probably about six months, seven months, maybe. And we were moving stuff. So he came over to help my mom put up some shelves and he was just a sweet guy. So my friend's like, well, let's take a walk and we'll go for a small walk and come back and do some more yard work or, or more housework. And it was dark. It was probably, I'd say at least 10 o'clock at night, at least 10. And we headed off down the road beside of where we lived. It was our house right on the main road, a big, huge pasture for mules and donkeys. And then the very first road was at the end of that, and you walked down. That road would go all the way down to the backside, and then there'd be a crossing road. If you got on that road, and you took a left to the end of that road to the stoplight, and then you took another left, it would pass right back in front of my house. So it was like a big square, but it was a very large square. <laughs> so we started walking, and we're just having a good time and talking about stuff, and we get to a different pasture, probably about half a mile quarter or about half a little over half a mile down that road and out of nowhere or the, to the right or the left of, of us was nothing but barbed wire fencing and then to the right there were some houses far back in the in a bunch of an open land there was some houses and stuff but not many uh to the right of us you could hear running like heavy footfalls 
and it was about two or three. And they were running towards us and snarling and not really a bark, but a deep kind of salivating kind of sound. It was, I still to this day can't describe it exactly what the sound was because I've never heard it besides recently here. It, it was kind of like a growl, kind of like a snarl mixed with what the chuffing sound of like a tig tiger's chuff. So it was kind of like that put with it. And there were three of them one a little smaller than the other two and they ran up towards us and the boy he he took tail and he he ran but there was nowhere for us to go because it was us on the road barbed wire fence on one side them running at us on the other and it was like i said it was the back part of that property that i had had all my encounters on and he he climbed the barbed wire fence i have never seen someone climb a barbed wire fence but he was up and over it and my friend, she was a little skinny girl. She was up and over it, too. I've always been heavier set. And I, I knew I was not going to clear a barbed wire fence. And I have uh, some health issues anyway. So I knew it didn't matter if I was in shape. I wasn't getting over that fence. So I backed up into it as far as I could go. And I just stared at it or stared at them. And I just looked and I ripped up my shirt and my jeans from the pieces of the barbed wire. And I, in the end, had to explain to my mother and the doctor why I needed a tetanus shot, which was not fun. And I ate cut into my skin and I, I pushed back as far as I could get on the fence. And I wouldn't say the feeling of fear. It was more feeling of that's too familiar to me. That looks like what I know. These aren't running away. <laughs> They're not leaving. And, and I just, it felt like everything inside of me had gone cold. And I really didn't worry so much for me at that point. I was worried about if anything happened to my friend. Because she she was like a sister to me. And I was I was just like, she's on the other side of the barbed wire fence. What if something's on that side too? And they were headed towards the road. And they had not stopped until right before they got to the edge of the road. In the back, probably farther towards the woods behind of them. I'd say probably at the edge line of that woods. It's probably about two or three acres away, a booming kind of snarl, growl, howl sound. And they stopped instantly. And one of them twitched back to look at it. And I couldn't make out their colors because it was dark, but they were the same thing I had seen before. And two were bigger than the other one. And the, they were all, the two bigger ones were bigger than the one I had seen the uh, first time outside the dog lot. So they were much bigger. And then the other one was probably... About, I'd say, the size, like I said, of a Mastiff or a Newfoundland, and the other two were bigger. And the one twitched his head back the minute it heard the howl sound and took another step forward. But then there was, like, a secondary howl sound, and they turned, and they ran off. At the same time they were running, I guess the woman living in that house had heard the sound, and she turned the light on. She opened her door, and I will never forget it. She looked. She slammed her door, and she turned her light off. It was like she was saying, you're on your own. That's no. And it, it was as if she knew what was going on, and she just shut it. So after they were back over the barbed wire fence, my friend said, I'm not walking back that way. I'm going to keep going. And I said, okay, all right. I'm, I'm, I don't, I don't, I don't want to drag it back to my house if it's going to follow me that way. Let's just, let's just go. And it took us about, I'd say, a good two almost three hours to do that entire walk and get home going in the giant square. And the entire time was just full of fear. Is it going to come back? Are they going to be right there? What's going to happen? And to the point that it was the most embarrassing moment of my life is a car drove by as we were passing a pasture almost home. And I screamed. I had not screamed during the issue with it when they were running, charging at us, but I screamed. Because there was a cow just standing there as close to the fence that it was at the pasture. And it was the humor we needed that I was screaming because of the cow. Because I thought there was another one there. It was the humor we needed to be able to get through that encounter. And we got back home and we, we just went to sleep. And me and my friend will periodically talk about it and we'll discuss it and we'll go into details. But that was the only encounter I really had at that property. But... You could still hear howls and things at night and growls off in the distance. But I have a feeling that we just lived too close to the road, even though it was still the country. 
and there was too many people that it wouldn't really come up there. Maybe it just stayed on that one bit of property. And I'm so thankful that that was one of my only encounters there. So thankful because it, it was bad, but it was better. So we had, we'd moved several times since then and we moved into the city. And when my mother passed away, my, like I said, told you earlier, my father and I discussed getting this property and it, it did occur to me that I'm going to be living very close to where I had my first encounter. And I mean, like I said, my father, he, when he was living at his rental place, he lived just a few miles shy of here. Even going to see him when I'd be there, I, in the back of my mind, we'd stay there two or three nights at a time where we'd go there, me and the girls. In the back of my mind, I was always uneasy. And I was a little bit afraid of the dark out there. Because since the encounters happened, I mean, I I used to like going for walks at night. I used to, I used to enjoy the woods. And now... At that point, I, I couldn't. I didn't. I, I'd lost a lot of the confidence in it. So we'd go and stay with him, and I'd, I'd always, at the back of my mind, I'd be like, we're still near there. And it had been 10, 11 years since then, and I'm like, well, maybe whatever it was had left. And to go back a moment on the first encounter, at that time, there was what they called a severe coyote problem, and people's front porches would be ripped open. And their dogs would get killed and their sheeps would be butchered in our area. And they were just saying it was the worst coyote problem they'd ever had. And the woman who ran the mall up here, we did volunteer work there. And we put a booth up for, uh, for the rescue work and, and service dogs that I volunteered with. And we were discussing it one day and she goes, I lost my dog. She goes, he was on the porch. We heard howling. We, we we heard the biggest sound we've ever heard. It was it was it was awful. Just screaming and snarling. And we went out there and the entire screen and porch had been ripped open. And the dog was just he was gone. He was he was demolished. It was it was very traumatic and she was talking to us about she goes, So you live out there, just be a little bit careful about the coyotes. She goes, We we guess it was a pack of coyotes, but in my experience, coyotes they can be vicious. They can. They go for easy prey. They like a challenge, but they go for easy prey. I don't know of a coyote myself that's going to get a pack together. They're not really pack animals. They're more solitary until it's breeding season. So they're not going to go up there and rip open that lady's screen porch. And I mean, she had a huge Labrador. She said he was about 90 pounds. I mean, I know they do get together and hunt in packs when they, they need it and they live out there, but I don't see them being bold enough to do that to the point where they know that that dog is there, those people are there. But that, that was going on at the time that we lived here uh, when I had the first encounter, and it was bad. I mean, at some point it got better, but everybody was talking about it. Coyotes were killing everything is what they were saying, and just all kinds of livestock, Cat, baby cows, uh, even an adult cow at times. They were getting sheep. It just because we live where there was a lot of farmers and they just tell stories and it'd be like, it's just, we lost another one. So that's always been in the back of my mind when I was visiting my father and on his property, you could hear things in the woods, but I didn't really have in depth encounters there. You could just hear something in the woods scruffling around and it, it wasn't anything bad, but you'd hear it. And I always did not want to, live in the exact location. Now, I won't lie. If the property that I lived at when I was 15, 16 years old, if it came up for sale and I was able to get it, I would go back there in a heartbeat. I had some great memories there. I I loved it. It was my it was my teenage home. It was it's a sense of home. I would go back there. Would I be afraid? Yes, but I would love it. It would just it would be nice to go back home. But as far as now, we, we discussed it and we were like, where are we going to look? So we looked at a couple different places and I said, I want to get close, but I don't want to be there. And my whole family has teased me whenever they say, I, whenever I tell them I saw something and they go, well, it's not real. So we uh, finally 
my dad told me, he goes, the house next to your uncle came up, and do you want to go look at it? And I was like, okay, yeah. I mean, we'll go look at it. So we went, and we, we, we came down here, and we looked, and I was like, it's great. I'll take it. I want to get the kids out of the city. And it had been probably, let's see, that was 20 was my last encounter. And that I really, 1920 right there was my last encounter. So I had been about eight, nine years almost around there, probably a little bit less of no encounters. And, and it had dulled down a little bit. Like it was still there, but it dulled down. And so we, we got the house and we started moving in and we uh, set up my little dog kennels and we got situated and for a while it was kind of like peaceful. It was like, well, maybe it's not going to happen. Maybe it's not there. And the way my dog kennels were set up at the time was I had a, I had a 30 by 20 and then attached to that 30 by 20 was a 10 by 20 or no, it was a 20 by 30 and then a 20 by 20 dog kennel. Cause I had them separated and we first got them put up for my wolf dogs when I got down here and I had my one male wolf dog and I had some other things in there. And what I can say about when we moved in here was there was a lot of coyotes. I mean, it, it was, it was really nice to hear them at night. You could just open the door and you'd hear them back in the woods, just yodeling and yipping and carrying on. And, and my wolf dog, he'd, he'd listen in and he'd hear it and then he'd howl and they'd quiet for a few minutes and then they'd, kick back up and it it was just nice living back in the country so I had a sense of security and it was probably a short bit after living here I can't say exactly around the same time but our dog kennels instead of being set up the way they were the outside of them would get pushed in in like a v-shape like something had pushed all the way in and my dad said well maybe it's the wind we can put up some tarps, keep them from the sun and the and the wind and things. I still only had the one wolf dog at the time, and I had a hunting dog that stayed out there that I was fostering until he found a home. And we got the tarps, and immediately the next day after we put the tarps out, the tarps were ripped open from the outside, not from the inside. Like they were clawed up and ripped open, and the fence was being pushed back in. And, and again, I can stress, it's never hurt one of the dogs but it was kind of something at least my size or bigger has to be doing that because it takes a lot of force to push a secure chain link fence all the way into a v-shape in the middle at that point it was like well, what are we going to do what are we going to do to it my dad speculated maybe he's pulling it in there and i was like he wouldn't be able to pull it from the middle and so we secured the con or the fence a little bit better. And we, um, after I got my female wolf dog, when she was a little older, we um, put up hot wire because she has a climbing problem. And anybody who's got a wolf dog knows they are escape artists. And it is so hard to keep them contained because they just, they go, go, go. But prior to the hot wire, we had moved one of the fences and I had, this side, it wasn't really dog man, but it was the start, really, of things besides the fence getting pushed in. Uh, a woman was bringing down some dog food because she had worked at a dog food plant, or whatever it was called, um, a meal. And she had about six, 700 pounds of it. And she was going to bring it to me because I lived closer to her than my friend who lived about two hours away. And she was just going to leave it. And my friend was going to pick some of it up. And she got there and I was like, well, do you want to meet the wolf dogs? Because she had met us through wolf dog groups and she's like, yeah, definitely. Let's, I want to meet them. So we walked down there to the fence and uh, it's daylight and I was introducing her to them and she was talking and carrying on. I'm just having a conversation and you could hear leaves cracking and, and, br and branches snapping. So I turned to look at it and my dad's right at six foot and my brothers are over six foot. And this thing had to be at least a good nine feet tall because it was above the trees that were out there the shorter trees like it was above it it was walking away from us and it was completely furred it was a grayish a grayish brown color more dark gray than brown and big broad shouldered broad backed 
arms down by its side. The trees were hiding its lower half, but it did not even seem concerned we were there. It was walking away, just like it had been there all, every day. And the woman goes, oh, that must be a hunter. And I was like, I don't know. It's like, hunters don't really wear fur suits or fur camouflage. Because, like I said, I was raised by my, with my father. He had hunting dogs. I went hunting a few times with him. I know what you buy, how you hunt, where you wear it. And I said, okay. And immediately, and she had been having a great time. We had been talking and carrying on. She goes, okay, well, I have to go. And she, she hurried and she left or abruptly like she was out of the driveway she was gone and later on she had mentioned to my friend i have more dog food for you but your friend's gonna have to pick it up here or i can bring it to you i'm not going back there and my friend asked her well is there did did she, did she say something she goes no she's a lovely person like the really sweet love the wolf dogs i'm not going back there i will drive it the two hours to you or you can come pick it up and at that point, I was like, that's my first real visual sighting here. It's the first one. But it was just walking away, so it wasn't anything. And slowly, as time went on, the fences still were messed with sometimes, but not as bad. We noticed the coyotes weren't as active. And at that point, one part, point of living here, I had rescued a little coyote pup. He was probably about six weeks old. Uh, they, Some woman was selling them on Craigslist and me and several people got them and took care of them until we could get them to the sanctuaries. And I, I had him and I had him from six weeks till he was a few months old. So I had a coyote. I mean, I, he, he was domesticated at that point so he could not be returned back to the wild. So he was gonna have to spend his life in the sanctuary because she had had him since the moment he was born. And so I, I speak coyote in a way. Like I, I know coyote body movements. I know when you have wolf dogs or exotics, the way people in the community say is you forget to speak doggy dog. You learn how to interpret body language in a whole different way. And now that I've had the experience, I can look back on it and realize the dog man I've seen, they speak a same form of body language that mimics canines kind of like more primal ones kind of like wolf dogs but mixed with people and the way we say is a dog needs you to solve problems if it can't it will look to you for advice a wolf doesn't need advice it'll figure it out and wolf dogs are a dead middle like you have your contents and wolf dogs you have your lows mids highs and so forth and every level of content reacts based on how much wolf is there you, you learn to read the body language so you, you you can you have to study it to be able to own exotics you have to learn when you're going to push buttons too far or when something's going to escalate uh, they're not unpredictable they're they're they love their people but they could do without you they could not care if you were there or not but dog wolf dogs are domesticated animals so they can't really survive on their own they just don't have that instinct but they're not normal dogs. And looking at it, the dog men have similar body language, but it's different. It's like you put in a person with it. And I only learned that now, which leads into later on. So the coyote started not being there. And before my dad wanted to move out here, he wanted to do some deer hunting. And he, he's, he's an avid hunter. I mean, he, he'd be out there any chance he got. Well, the deer stopped being close to our property. He had went out there several times to hunt, several, several times. And he had seen some deer tracks, but he had never seen any. And nobody else had seen them for a while. Like they just started slowly not being as available. And it was, it was, it was odd. You know, I said, my dad, he's a big manly man. He's not afraid of much. I've never known my father to back down from something. He's comfortable in his skin. He's 100% in his beliefs. He knows what he wants. He knows how to do it. My dad can do and build anything. He, you give him a description of what you want, he can do it. He's not any kind of way afraid of something. But he didn't find any deer. He couldn't really see any. Um, I'd go down there sometimes. He has a, a little hunting blind he set up. I'd sit with him for a while, and he'd 
we don't have any luck and see my 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 wanting of him to hunt i personally probably could not hunt i just couldn't put it in me to to kill a deer i just probably couldn't but i want them i want the deer because <laughs> uh i feed my wolf dogs a mixture of kibble and raw diet and i want him to get me some deer because any kind of free food for an animal is great but it started with the coyotes and then the deer and if you start stepping into the woods you hear wood sounds like you can hear the creek back there you can hear like birds but you don't have many other sounds of animals back there as much like if you sit in our front porch you'll see probably at any point several squirrels you'll see tons of other animals but head more towards in the woods you're not seeing them as much and we have went back there a few times trying to just walk along the creek beds and we uh, wanted to look around and it just, it was kind of like a bunch of the animals weren't there. They were just leaving. And we saw some tracks. We saw some smudged paw prints and we assumed hunters because there's a lot of hunters out here with their dogs. And we saw not as many deer, not, we saw a few little raccoons, but it, the sense of it is, it's just, it was weird. It was different. Things were not how they should be. And it started with that, and then stuff started going moving around our yard. Stuff would be moved. The kennels would be pushed in. Um, same thing kind of happened at my aunt's property next to me. She ended up selling her chickens and getting rid of them. She uh, had fences messed with, and she just didn't want to deal with the chickens anymore. And I raised rabbits at certain points, and I had a bunch of rabbits that I had gotten. And really, I guess it started escalating with the rabbits getting killed. And it, it reminded me of when the chickens were killed when I was younger, because sometimes they would just be killed. They, they wouldn't be anything happened to them except for they'd be killed. And then sometimes they would be like ripped through the cage or occasionally some would just be gone. And one point um, I had a really nice rabbit hutch from like tractor supply where you lift the lid. It's very, very heavy heavy lid and one night you could hear that lid fall and hit the top of the cage like it had been lifted and then just dropped without casually sitting it down because if you didn't sit it down delicately like it made a loud sound and yeah i heard it and i went out there and the rabbit was gone like there was just one or two rabbits gone and i assumed i was like well maybe somehow that rabbit got out or my dad goes well maybe you got a raccoon or a possum and we used to feed the possums out here like my, my niece named them and the one mama possum she would come around and she'd bring all her babies and we'd feed them only food for them on the porch and we'd take care of all the stray animals and the possums left we would have several of them killed and left on the property and it started like when i was younger there'd just be like random kills of things out there and again because we live in the country my dad would say maybe it's coyote and i was like well coyotes kill to eat more so than other things so i don't know why it's leaving stuff and i mean we have possums get killed by dogs sometimes and we just it, it happens and then we had a skunk killed and it was utterly the only things left from that skunk in our backyard was the tail the stink part the stink gland whatever it's called i don't know and the fur and nothing else was there a very little blood but it was just it was there and instead of the coyote sounds out there you could hear other kinds of yips and howls and like i have the wolf dogs so they howl they don't bark and it's so beautiful when they do so it's like you can hear them sometimes when they howl something howls back but it doesn't sound quite right it sounds different not right it sounds kind of like a mimicking almost of what their howl sounds like it's very in-depth it's 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 bone chilling it's kind of it's not something you'd want to hear it, unlike where the wolf dogs like when they howl it's really pretty and my dad a coin like he he says he goes, it's like listening to something at yellowstone you hear it and it's pretty and i didn't like it I still don't to this day. Anytime I hear it howl back, I just, I don't. 
it's not something I'm pleasant with. And after the rabbits started getting killed, I stopped getting rabbits for a while. I didn't have any rabbits. I completely stopped. I didn't get any more. Stuff would still go missing. We had a few outside cats that we had uh, gotten from being strays or we had adopted. And the cats just were not there. And it wasn't just our cats. It was anyone who had cats in the little neighborhood we live in. They'd vanish. My cousin would call me from down the end of the street. She'd be like, have you seen our cat? And I'd ask her which one and if I'd seen it. And at that point, we had probably three outside cats left. And I contacted a friend of mine and I was like, look, do you want to adopt the cats? I don't want anything to happen to them. The other ones have just vanished. I, I really don't know what's going on with them, but I don't, I don't want anything to happen. So she took the three remaining cats and she, uh, she said they're, we're doing great there. And it was, it was, it felt kind of like I was giving in. Like I just, I was giving up on it and I was giving in, but we started hearing, um, more elevated things from that point growling kind of rustles in the in the leaves and the way the house is we are on we have our front yard and then our house and then about an acre and a half or a little more in the backyard and there's the dog kennels we have a tree and then the wood line and there's woods on either side of our home and there's a driveway that goes all the way down and up into the woods behind us where our neighbors live and there's like a big kind of runoff resource pond it's sometimes it dries up and sometimes it doesn't and we had some in the beginning before things escalated to where they are now um we heard some stuff on the porch at night like it was moving around and we woke up one morning and it looked like something had had its hands on the wall of our house by our door and they had been muddy or covered in something we to this day we don't know what it was but it had been around the outside of the house in different parts and it just looks like two hands were there and slid down a little bit on the side of the house. But right by the door, it looks like the hands were just resting there. And the fingers were really long and broad palmed. And it, it was weird. And it was abnormal. And I, my niece goes, have you ever seen anything like that? Because she was just a child when we had our first encounters. And I said, I, I have kind of, but I, I really don't want it to be that. And that's what I noticed. Like I said, we have the red clay mud. I noticed that there were a lot of tracks in the mud and sometimes they were smeared and bigger. And I just hoped it was, you know, whatever it was, was just passing through. And we, they said, I didn't have rabbits for a really long time. We just, my dad assumed it was a coyote. My nieces, they hoped for the best. And me, I just preemptively was like, please don't. And the way I describe the smell of these things, because there is a common smell and sound that I associate with them. The smell is like wet dog mixed with like wet dog, kind of like decaying kind of stinky meat and, and pee, heavily of like pee, like a cross between cat and dog, because cat pee has a very ammonia kind of smell to it, almost like it stings your nose and that's like a very heavily condensed kind of smell those three mixed together which is not the most pleasant thing it's kind of what it smells like and everywhere that i've had encounters that smell has lingered uh, at one point the the deer skin that we had the left on the tree it permeated like it was just all over that tree we couldn't get rid of the smell and the deer hide stunk like it it was it it smelled like it had peed on it in a way so when I started noticing the smell, I, at that point, like I said, I didn't know what a dog man was. I had never heard of a dog man. I just assumed some kind of creature, something, I didn't know what. And I was like, well, these things do live here because I've had the experience. They do live here. The first close encounter was, we had a wolf dog and my male had already passed away at this point. My female had the same thing. They had a malopathy, um, which essentially is very common in German Shepherds. They're, they lose their body mass. They lose their muscles. And then their organs go to shut down and their pancreas fails. 
she had passed away in January of, not this recent January, but the year before. So she had passed away in January of, I believe, 2019. And it had been really rough on me, but I knew it was coming. So my dad had buried her. And a little ways into the woods, he had buried her. And previously we had had animals that had passed away we buried. They occasionally would get dug back up and be in our yard in places. And we just assumed a, a stray dog or something. It didn't always happen, but sometimes it happened. Well, he buried her into the woods. And he, I know where he buried her. He, he, he buried her. She was there. And I go out and I water the dogs every day and I feed them. And I go to every fence and I check around to see if there's any kind of places that the dogs that are out there can get out. Um, and my niece goes, she's in the backyard. And I was like, what do you mean? She goes, she's behind the fence. And sure enough, I will tell you, Vic, that I went out there and she had been dug up and just dragged to that location, not carried, kind of dragged and left there. And at that point, I knew my father had buried the dog. Like, we, we, we knew she had been buried. And my previous wolf dog, I had had cremated, but her I did not. And it was very... It was very really troubling to, to, to see that. And it only happened right after she had passed away. And so at that point, I was like, either whatever this thing is did that. Or one of our neighbors was really crazy. And my dad, he, he buried her a second time. He went and he buried her. And it happened again. and Not right after, but it happened again and he buried her and she stayed buried that time and unfortunately um more recently probably a few months ago uh it had dug her skeleton up like her skeleton remains had been scattered a short ways into the uh the wood line it had they just been looked like a few of them had been dragged there not the whole thing and there were it, it was just not very, it's very troubling to me. It was a very sensitive thing. Like I said, it doesn't happen every time we had something pass away that we buried. Only sometimes. And it, it's happened with a puppy that we rescued, but she was too sick and couldn't make it. It's happened with one of the wildlife animals I was rehabbing, and the baby was just too weak. It's, it's just, it's happened. And there will be a multitude of other uh, skeletal things sometimes just scattered like every so often there'll be like a random bone in the driveway but when you live in the country like that you just assume you know something was passing by and dropped it but it, it it's like it's left deliberately in places and so at that point I knew something more was going on and I had already connected the dots and been like it's it's one of those things and that's when a friend of mine was like, hey, have you ever heard of a dog man? And I was like, no. And she's like, well, it sounds a lot like what you talk about. So she connected me at that point to articles and different things like that. And I was like, it sounds a lot like that. It's very similar. And we had not had a completely visual sighting of the dog man here at that point. We had had brief sounds. We had had things happening. We had had growls. We had had missing wildlife, but we had not had a visual completely. And that completely changed. The first complete visual. We were driving home. It's myself, my father, and my niece in the car. And in front of our property is a stretch of woods. And then there's some houses. And then the main road that we traveled down to come home. And we were driving. And this large giant mass of animal. It was moving very fast. So you couldn't make out extreme details, but you could tell the color of it, the, the fur length. It was a very large gray, like dark gray with really vibrant reddish brown mark, like tint to it. And it ran right past the car very fast, headed towards our house. And it was, it, it was big. It was bigger than any of the ones I think I had seen ever. And 
it moved so fast. I have never seen anything move that fast before. So I've had my run-ins where I've been driving and animals run in front of the car, but it, it beat running in front of the car. Like within it, with it, we were going pretty normal speed. It, it just, car did not even get close to it. It was so fast. And we discussed what it, we thought it was. And I'm, I, my dad's like, maybe just a large dog coyote. And it didn't, to this day, I swear, and I will, I will, I will bet my life, it was not running on four feet, is what I will say when I see it. It was not on all fours. It, at one point, it looked like maybe it dipped down to four feet when it hit the grass, but it was, it was running what I think was upright, and or at least hunched over, headed upright. That was the first of many sightings. We, me and my niece, we like to go out at night shopping. We don't like to do. A lot of daytime shopping because I have uh, anxieties and social anxiety about being in too big crowds. So we tend to go later at night. And the second one was we were pulling in the driveway and our our uh, headlights hit the thing in the backyard. And it's standing because we don't have a light in our backyard now. So if, unless it's a flashlight or car lights, we don't have one. So it's dark back and we pulled in and the headlights landed on it and it lifted its head up and it ran into the woods and it was fast and it was that one was lighter than the one that had ran into the road like it was a lighter kind of color than that but for the i mean i can't be certain it was not the same one because i only glimpsed the other one and glimpsed this one but it ran fast and my niece was like what is that and I was like I don't I don't know so we got out and I took the light and I kind of looked around and at that point I was hoping without a shadow of a doubt I was hoping maybe we just had some very large dogs in the woods but we didn't and that happened several times it, it'd be when we pull in the, the one, it would be pulling in and the lights would be shining and it would be in various parts of the yard and would just take off when the lights were on it. And again, I had only encountered probably one or two of these things that was not, that did not run. So I had only had nonviolent encounters except for twice, but I wasn't willing to bet another one. So we were pulling in and Sometimes when my niece and I, we pull in the driveway, we'll sit in the car for a few minutes and we'll either eat if we brought home food or we'll talk, we'll watch YouTube videos on our phone or show something to each other. And I had the lights off and we were talking and I, I cranked the car. I don't remember why, but I just clicked it so the lights were on and we we're just sitting there talking and all of a sudden it runs in front of the car like it had been near the car when the lights were off, but we hadn't seen it, and it runs in front of the headlights and goes for the woods. It was a smaller one, so not as big as the other one, but it just, it just dashed straight for the woods past us, and the dogs were going ballistic at it, just barking, and well, the dog dog was. The other two don't bark, but they were throwing a storm, like a big fit, and I just, I wouldn't get out of the car. I, I told her, I was like, I'm not getting out for a few minutes. I, I don't trust that. So we continued to have our sightings like that, and it was very normal. It was a very normal occurrence. It should not be a normal occurrence to have something like that happen, but it was. And then I would say it started to get bolder, less afraid, kind of adapted to us. And I was in my kitchen having a snack. It was later at night, probably 12 one o'clock somewhere around there in the morning and I had my phone propped up watching YouTube and the front door was wide open we just had the screen door and I had my lights on and at that point I had started to get rabbits again it was fairly recently just a few months back that this sighting happened and I had just started to get rabbits again and I would venture to say that they're getting bolder to the point where it did not care that that light was on and I'm just sitting there, and also I glance up, and where it is is my kitchen island. From that, you can look into the living room, and you can see the big bay windows there, and then you can see the front door with the window open. And our porch wraps around. It goes from the front of the house 
to the side of the house and then to the back porch. And our back porch, the way it is currently, I should have explained this the other day, is you can't leave the back, the porch through the back porch. Like you just, you can't get down those stairs right now. So I'm sitting there and I'm looking out and in the blink of an eye, this thing runs past the front door and past the windows going very fast. The thing I can, like, I can best compare the color of it to. And I told my dad, I was like, it looked a little bit like a hyena colors and body structure. It had no tail. Its ears were kind of pinned back a little bit like because it was running. I guess it was excited. But it just, it raced past the door. And as I said, you can't get off the back porch. It had to have jumped off the porch at some point. Like, it had to have just scaled and jumped off the side of the porch. There was really, it could have got as far as the back door. And then it would have had to climb over something and jump off the back deck or jump off before it got there. Because it, it it ran. And it was fast. And I, I had the most natural reaction to it I could gather. I stood up. I walked to my front door. <laughs> I, I believe I cracked open the screen door a little bit and I looked. I shut it. I shut my front door. I locked it. And I just said, I cannot help you, rabbits. Um, I hope it doesn't get you, but I can't help you. And I went back and I made sure the back door was locked and the light was off. And I sat down. And I, and I gathered my phone and I told my friends that I was talking to at the time on the phone. I was like, this is what's happened. I saw this thing. It was on the porch. And it had never really been on the porch when we were downstairs or awake before we, we had heard sounds of it scuffling around on the porch we had never had interaction with it on the porch it had never been that bold so to say and I, I was like this is reaching a whole new level that I haven't experienced before I don't know how to rationalize it being there my dad was like well it was just a big coyote I was like no I know coyotes we don't have them anymore often. And, and I know coyote body language. I know what they look like. That was not a coyote. And the first thing I says, there's a, not to give my exact location away, but there is a, it's generally in the same area because everybody knows I live in Cleveland. There is a small exotic park just down the road from where we live. And I say exotic park. The man has tigers and he has all kinds of animals. And I was like, does he have hyenas? Because that's kind of what it looked like. And how big does a hyena get? Because I, I always say when his tigers get out. Not if, but when. I'm going to be one of the first people who accidentally finds one. So I was like, well, maybe he had a hyena or something like that. Or I know he probably doesn't have hyenas. But I was like, it, 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 it's what it kind of looked like. I was like, it just it looked like that thing. And I knew what it was. And I was like, it's coming to go on the porch. And it did not hurt the rabbits that night. I think it was just, it was playing or having a good time. And it didn't care that I was there. Had it wanted to, all I had between me and it was that glass door. That was it. And it, it was, that was it. It was me and the glass door. And it did not pause to look at me. And it definitely heard me. Because I believe these things are as good at hearing if not better than my dogs. And my dogs outside can hear me when I wake up in my bedroom. The minute I leave my bedroom and I go into my bathroom to brush my teeth, my outside dog, she knows I'm awake. And she'll start getting excited and barking. She knows I'm up. So I know it could hear me. I was playing as day in the kitchen. And then the feeling of unease started accelerating. It's to the point where you can't walk past your windows at night without knowing something is very close to the window watching you. Like I said, I had heard scuffles in the woods and various things like that, but it, it was like that point was a turning point. It no longer cared. Whatever it was was like, okay, this is cool. Let me uh, up at a level. And sometimes I will feed the dogs later at night if I have a busy day instead of doing it in the mornings. And I, I have three that are out there, my two wolf dogs, and I have my German Shepherd. And she is in the last containment. And with wolf dogs, you build containments to keep them in because they have to have something really sturdy. Uh, she's currently in the actual wolf dog containment, not the chain link. It's 10 foot tall. It's made with big 4x4s four four and 2x4s. 
and cattle panel. It's got a cattle panel along the ground. It's got, it, it, it's hard to do something to that. And previously to her being in there, my male wolf dog had been in here. And this happened before I actually had ever put her outside. And I took some pictures of the damage that I can show if anybody wanted to see them or you wanted to see them. One day I had went outside and he was on the front porch just sitting there because he, he is a very docile dog. He doesn't do much. He, he just he was just sitting there and I was like, well, how'd you get out of the fence? Because when I'm saying these things are built escape proof, you build them to the point that things cannot get out. You don't necessarily always think about things going in. You think about making sure that they can't get out. So I walk him back there and the door's off the hinge. And again, I'll put it forth that I don't think it was going to hurt him or wanted to because the wolf dogs don't really seem bothered too much by it. The dog dogs, they don't like it. Any dog dog I've ever had that's had with me in a counter, they don't like it. But the, the wolf dogs, I think they said on, an, on a mental, emotional level, they read each other's body language. And he was unharmed. I, I, I mean, I'm not as bold to say it will not harm them because I don't put it past them. But I think they feed off each other's energy. So it was ripped right off the hinge. The bottom hinge was completely ripped off. And the top hinge was halfway off. And I myself, I mean, I mean I'm a bigger girl. I don't think I could have pulled it off like that. And I don't even think my father, he's a very strong man. I don't think he could pull that off. Like, I don't think he could rip it off. And it was clawed up and chewed and... When I said this, this dog, he's very docile. He's very sweet, and he's got a good temper. He, he might not like other male dogs. <laughs> he's never ran into one of those except for a small dog that he can be around. But he, he, he's never done anything. So I'm just staring at it, and I'm looking at him, and I had to shimmy the door back into place, and I moved him in with the female, and I was like, well, this is a new experience. <laughs> Um, it's not just chain link anymore. It's messing with the, the cattle panel fence. So we got it fixed and we reinforced some stuff and he stayed in with the female and he stayed in there. And then when my German shepherd, she, she was moved in there. I'll go down there more recently. It started. I'd go down there to feed her and you could hear footfalls and kind of branches and twigs and just wood sounds of something moving. And in the beginning, it was farther off in the woods. And because of my previous encounters, I would shine my flashlight as far as I could into the woods without looking. I would put the food or anything that I was taking out there to them in, and I would back up with my back facing towards my house. And it's a sense of complete and utter, like, it's just terror, fear that shoots through me. And I will beg my niece I'll be like or my dad I'll be like just stay outside with me while I do it just just don't go outside don't go in please don't go in without me and most times if I'm able to I will turn the headlights on the car and shine them back there because previously to the boulder experiences they didn't like to come into the sunlight too much or well, not sunlight but the lights of cars and stuff and for a while that was my safety net I had it that was shine the light maybe it'll stay away maybe maybe it doesn't like it and it stopped being so far away and then it will make sounds you can hear scraping on trees and as bold as recently as a few weeks ago it was just right in the edge line and you can't see much into the woods even with a flashlight and it was not on four feet i, I at first i was like maybe it's one of the neighbors just be the neighbor and then i heard a sound I still can't explain. It's not the growling sound. It's not the, the chuffing sound. It was a different sound. It, it was it was really kind of just like an inner chest kind of grumbly sound like a person would make, but different. And I, I at that point, I had been like, I'm not doing this at night anymore. I'm not. I mean, I still, I still will now, but... I said, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to try to not do this at night anymore. And I went in and I said, you're, you're, I told my dad, I'll tell him every time I come back in, you're going to have to do something to figure out what to do about that thing in the woods. That thing in the woods has got to stop. It, it's got to stop. Well, I had been on my porch 
And I believe I was outside getting some dog food because we keep them in big trash cans. We had to start storing the dog food differently because we'd go out there and the bag would be ripped to pieces, thrown all over the ground, just thrown all over the, the porch. And um, since my big, since I started hearing it get closer, in my mind, I thought I'm going to leave some dog food here at the edge line of the woods. Every time I feed them, maybe I can make it not want to hurt me if it decides it wants to. It would, it would never take the dog food. Dog food has never been touched. It's still there, just not touched. Well, I was out on the porch getting some dog food because I feed the inside dogs again before I go to bed. And I feed them in the morning and in the afternoon. And on that side of the porch, I could hear slow steps and growling that growl sound uh, the chuffing snarling growling sound and it was getting closer and then I, I believe it was it smacked maybe or clawed at the side of the lattice on the edge of our porch i was done i i took my cup of dog food i did not even put the lid back on the dog food i Walked back in the house, I shut the door, I locked the door, I turned around, I avoided my back door window, because I know enough about this thing to know that it's going to, that it can get wherever it wants to go, and I avoided the back door as, as fast as I could, and got to my room, and then I called my dad from my room, and I said, you're going to have to do something about that thing in the woods, it was almost on the porch with me, it was there, it has done that several times, it's just, it gets closer, and you can't see it, because it's dark, but you can tell it was there, and you can hear it, and I'm not the only one who has had experiences like that in the neighborhood. Um, like I said, there's not many of us neighbors. And the neighbors will call me uh, or text me or stop on the side of the road and be like, hey, did your dog get out? Because we saw your wolf dog in the woods or around our property running around. And I'll be like, no, they, they didn't get out. And mine, one is a gray and white colored female wolf dog. She's a low content. She looks a lot like a Malamute. But you, you can see she's not. And then my male is a white, creamy liver kind of mixture of a color. And they'll describe it, and it will be a different color. And I'll be like, no, I don't have one like that. And then they'll tell me, it'll be like, no, it's got to be one of yours. It was bigger than a coyote, and it was big. And it's got to be your wolf dog. It looked like a wolf. And I was like, well, we don't have wild wolves out here. I mean, we just don't have them. And... I've seen, I will say that I have seen at least one or two. So I can't say that we don't have them. I've seen them at various areas. I was like, but, but we don't have them, like, as, as populated to have that experience. Like, they're just not a whole pack of wolves hanging out in the woods that you're going to see all the time. But they would tell me, they'd be like, well, we saw it. And it's happened so many times. One of them was the neighbor down the street saw it on the other side of her wooden fence. And she said it must have been on his standing with his head over the fence, pawing, because all I could see was the top of his ears and the top of his head. And I was like, mine don't leave my yard if they do get out. And after the experience with it being walking up the side of the porch, I started having experiences during the day. And I would be out there, and you could hear it in the woods running around or in movements, and you'd hear off of the distance kind of sounds. And... The most recent encounter, well, besides a few days ago, was the one that pushed me to contact you and the and my friend was like, hey, you should, that guy you listen to, you should contact him and tell him what's going on and see if he wants to talk to you about it. And I was like, okay, I have now just one outside cat. He's a little stray cat we've been feeding and we took him in and he's gotten neutered. He's got his shots and everything, and he stays on the porch, and he's a good hunting cat, like, he, he, he gets a lot, he handles a lot of the outside rat problems for a lot of people in the neighborhood, and they like him, they, they, they idolize the cat, they think he's great, and so I was on the porch, and I can't remember what I was doing, but I was out there, and I heard the sounds of a, like, a smaller sized animal, maybe a rabbit, a bit, because it's baby animal season, it's like a baby rabbit, or maybe a squirrel, like the cat had gotten it and it was attacking it. And it was just, there was no rustling sounds, no leaves moving, just the sound of it screaming. I was like, oh, he's got something. And my mentality is, even if he's got it and it's a baby animal, I try to take it from him. 
I'd rather take it from him and either get it put out of its misery or try and rehab it or something like that. And I have a soft spot for baby rabbits because the first animal I ever rehabbed was a baby rabbit when I was about nine years old. So that's my soft spot is rabbits. They're, my, they're Wild rabbits are my soft spot. And I was like, oh, it's cool. He's just a day. He's just in the edge of the woods. Our driveway comes from the road just down to our porch and there's a patch of woods between me and my aunt's home and it's a very thick woods and he was just on the inside of the woods like right over the little bit of grass into the woods so I started walking close and I'd stop and I'd kind of like I'd call the cat and what I have noticed is that when I'm having the experiences the cat is long gone he he will not stay with me and he won't even be on the porch or in the yard when something like this is happening. He just is out of the area. He won't stay there. So I was calling him, and he normally comes right away. And every time I would kind of stop moving, it would scream again. And it, it, was, it was like it was holding it or had it and was trying to get me to go closer because I was walking towards it. And then when it, scree- when, it, when it made the animal scream one of the last two times, I'm not sure if it stepped or if it tripped or if something moved, but it made a big crunching sound, like like hitting the leaves. And automatically I went, that's not my cat. And what I what I had said, I, vo- I vocalized a lot. I was like, that's not my cat. And I said his name. I was like, that's not Charmin. No. And it, it did the squeak again, like it was like torturing the little animal to try and get me to get closer. At that point, I knew what it was. It was not him. And it was just right there at the edge of the, of the woods beside our driveway, which is the closest I'd ever had an experience here before besides the porch. And I stopped. And I started backing up with my back facing the door. And the way I can put it is I think the thing knew, well, this game's not going on anymore. She's not going to come over here. And there was one last scream from the animal and a crunch. Like it had killed it. And then it just didn't run. It slowly walked off. Just like it didn't care. It just walked off. It was not phased at all. And I backed up and I went back inside. And I'll know periodically when I have an encounter or whenever it's there and I can't see it. Because my inside dogs will stare out the window. And this is how I know when it's there. I can't see it. But the dogs can. They'll know. And my inside dogs will be snarling and growling and throwing themselves at the window. And, the, and we'll be like, there's nothing there. What are, you, what are you even looking at? But they all can tell. And then the dog outside, because the only one who barks is the German Shepherd, she'll be barking. And then the wolf dogs will be pacing and staring at the woods. And it's not always the same space. And it's different times of day. And dogs bark at things they'd see, but it's a switch in them that goes off. And the inside dogs will do anything they can to get out that window. And they'll be snarling and growling. And it's to the point where I don't let my dogs go outside to the bathroom at nighttime. If it's at nighttime, I'm there. My dad's there. We have the flashlight or a phone light. It's a few seconds out and then in. I don't let my dad to let the dogs out by himself. I want to be there to watch them. My little dogs go out with me during the daytime. But if I'm out there and I can just feel it's there watching, I don't go back out. My dogs don't go out. I don't leave them unattended. Because I know that it hasn't hurt those ones. But I know that these ones are small. They're tinier dogs. They're The thing about little dogs is they're little dogs with big dog attitudes. My little Chawini male dog. He storms the cage of my wolf dog, snarling and growling and thinking he's hot stuff. The, the wolf dog just looks at him like it's crazy. Nothing is going to stop that dog from charging that thing if he thinks he's big and bad and can beat it. I'm not going to put them in, in danger of letting that happen. So I don't let them out of my sight. I, If I could domesticate my male cat enough to bring him in completely, I would. But I just can't get him to be an inside cat. I've tried. And like I said, it's it's now impacting that I can't let the dogs outside. I, I moved to the country for my dogs. 
I moved out here, not just for my outside dogs that have to live there, but my, my little dogs. And when I see the neighbors walking their dog, I'm just like, they don't let him outside at night, at night either. And there's, there's a patch of woods between me and the neighbor to my right. And their dog goes off. All the dogs in this area, you can hear them for a while back. At certain times of night, they'll just go off. And dogs don't always bark together. Some will just bark for no reason. But when that kind of chain goes off, every dog, as far as you can hear, is just going off. It, it's barking, growling. And, and I, I can tell my dogs apart from their bark because each is different. And if it's the one dog barking, it's like, oh, he barks at the wind. If it's the other one barking, it's different. And wolf dogs generally don't bark, as I've said. My female, she can bark, but it's it's something she doesn't do. And I have only ever heard my male wolf dog bark once. And I've had him for several years. And it was a few weeks ago. I was in the yard giving them their treats. And it was daytime. And he was staring at the woods. And he let out a bark. And I stopped and I looked at him and I was like, you don't bark. What, what was that? And he did it again. And it wasn't a aggressive bark. It was a, oh, friend, something there, bark sound. And I stared at him. And I looked at the other dog and I noticed her attention was wrapped on the, like, right there at the woods. I was like, well, this has been fun. I'm going to go back in. And... It's happened a few times because I'll go in the fence with the dogs and during the summer you brush their coat out. So I have been inside the wolf dog fence getting closer to night and I've been in there with them. And sometimes I have stayed in there if I heard it in the woods. I have stayed inside the fence with the wolf dogs and I have waited. At one point I waited until my father got home and I waited till he got home to leave the wolf dog fence. And while wolf dogs naturally are not protective of their owners, they don't have that mentality. I just knew it hadn't bothered them yet. I was staying inside the fence. There was a fence between me and it. It was not a strong fence, and I knew it wouldn't hold it back, but there was a fence. It was something. And I didn't get out. My dad got home late that day. I didn't. Uh, before I have called him <laughs> from outside, and I've been like, hey, I'm in the fence. Can you come to the yard so I can go? And it's it's been it's, it's been hard to handle, but the the wolf dogs they're a key element to kind of i guess i would say know when something is not just something that's bothering dogs because their body language you learn it you learn what it is and when i first got involved in wolf dogs i learned what the sound of them resource guarding was because they all have it and i was like i know that sound that that kind of body language that's when i realized that i had been encroaching this thing, the first sighting I had at the other property, or well, not the first sighting, but the sighting with the one under the house is I had gotten to something it didn't want me to get to, that it belonged to, and it was telling me back off. Now, we still are having sightings. We've, we've had a few going on. Um, yesterday, it was in the edge of the woods during the daytime, but we didn't, we didn't see it. We just heard it. And our neighbor up on the hill behind us, he has a lot of guns and he shoots his guns off. And yesterday he started at about seven in the morning and he did not stop until about 11 o'clock at night last night. And he was still shooting them off every single second. And so it was a little bit more active yesterday with, I guess I didn't like the gunfire and it hung out near the dog lot I think back in the woods and uh, I I was waiting on him to stop and I was ready for him to just stop because I, I wanted the dogs to calm down and uh, they weren't necessarily going crazy at it it was more so the gunfire but the neighbors have seen things you can't that you kind of have this look about you once you've had an encounter and you can drop keywords into things and they'll tell you um, we have one family that moved in after we did and she goes I remember when my parents came to look at the house and the land they built their house when they came to look at the land there were three big wolves that ran past our car they were the biggest wolves I have ever seen and they just ran right in front of the car into your yard and I have never had 
three wolf dogs out at one time. I'll have a slip up with the fence every now and then. We had a mudslide and we had a, the mudslide happened and we had our kennel collapse. And my male, he was on my front porch, a different male than the one I have now. And I told her, I was like, what do you mean? Wolves. She goes, big wolves. And some people, they think of huskies and they compare them to, oh, I had a husky. It looked like a wolf. And I was like, you sure you didn't mean huskies? The neighbor up the street, he's got a husky. And she goes, no. They were, they looked a little bit like yours, but they were bigger and just ran straight in front of the car and ran off. And my dad slammed on the brakes and he got out to look. And she goes, and I saw yours in the fence, but I thought yours had gotten out more than you had. And I said, no, I've never had three that color. And it's, it, it's kind of, I guess, the areas that we have around here must just be heavily populated. Or they have a, they have a good food source out here because we live in the middle of the country. There's tons of deer. Um, we have all kinds of stuff. I mean, any given night, you go down the street across from us driving, you, you could see seven, eight deer just seven, eight of them, maybe more. There's a little, there's a little, uh, field going down the hill down the road and there'll be tons of wild turkeys in there and deer. And we saw an actual coyote just standing there one day hopping around. And so it's got a good food source. Um, but it's getting bolder towards, I think, not caring. It's like, Oh, well, she knows I'm there. I know she's there. Let's see what I can do to make it interesting. And uh, due to what your advice you gave me the other day, when the last couple of days, I've been repeating that mantra in my head. I've been repeating it when I'm outside, and I was able to calm myself up enough to step a little bit into the wood line. And I was like, I'll take some pictures around here in case Vic wants to see any of the terrain or anything. And I'll take some pictures of the broken door. And I was okay to do that. I, I did it a little bit better than I thought I did. I was proud of myself. I was like, I didn't run away in fear. I did good. And uh, we had a quiet day with, with nothing going on. And aside yesterday, we thankfully have had a few days without any kind of sighting. I do know that it was out there yesterday and last night, but I think more so it was, it was too preoccupied with other things to care what I was doing. But it's it's an ongoing situation and every day is like a new different kind of what is it going to do now well it's a huge understatement to say that i'm so sorry to hear about all those encounters you've had to deal with jay you deserve a lot of credit for holding it together the way you have i mean no one should have to experience half as many encounters as you have it's been a huge thing to go through and it's at times like i said i don't consider it as bad as always it's kind of a learning curve and it's refreshing and reassuring to know that there are other people out there who have had experiences. Some people have had a lot worse experiences than me. They've had more close calls and I'm, I consider myself lucky. I'm on the edge of experiences that have not ended in too much of a dangerous situation. Yeah. Thank goodness for that. Well, I've got tons of questions. I'd like to ask you about your experiences, but unfortunately we're about out of time here. Would you be willing to come back next week so we could talk more about your experiences? I would love to. I mean, I'm happy and willing to answer any kind of questions. Oh, great. Well, let's do that then. We'll just have you back next week and we'll take it from there. But in the meantime, thanks again so much for coming on and doing this. You know, we really appreciate it and have a great night. If you've had a dog meet encounter of your own and would like to speak with me, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. I'd love to hear from you.